Okay. Hi everyone. <laughs> so welcome to the Best of Bristol Lectures. It's a student-run initiative and it was previously um, funded by the Alumni Foundation but this year it's going to be funded by Bristol Institute of Learning and Teaching. Um, it was initially started up in revived in 2012 um, but this year we're back for another series so that's great um, and it's just basically a way of showcasing the university's best teaching within departments to the rest to the rest of the uni community um, so we actually have our first joint lecture nomination tonight um, dr duncan boa and dr chris snyder and they are in the engineering department um, and i was reading that there Research consists of uh, some Lego related stuff and <laughs> um, informatics and um, other stuff. So um, I'm, I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over um, to them both and I hope you have a very good evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks for everyone for coming here this evening. Uh, I'm Duncan. And I'm Chris. Uh, and we're from the Design and Manufacturing Group, which is part of the Department of Engineering, uh, Mechanical Engineering, University of Bristol. So we're going to give a talk tonight about the language of design, how drawings have built the world. And Chris is going to do the first half, and then I'm going to take over, and I'm going to do the second half. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris, and I'll come back up in a bit. Thank you very much. OK, so um, we're going to try to tell you a bit of a story this evening. It's quite an important story, really, because what we're going to talk about we think is one of the fundamental things that allowed us as humans to reach the point that we have today. So as engineers, as inventors, as innovators, we've developed the ability to create incredible things, the phones you have in your pocket, the, um, the cars, the planes, the trains that get us all around the world. And all of those have been enabled really by a single thing, a really vital part of our history. And it's what we would call the language of design. And so what I'm gonna to try to do today is, is tell you where that's come from, why it's so important, and why pictures like this really did create the world. So, like all good stories, it has a beginning, and this beginning goes back a really long way. We go all the way back to, to cavemen, essentially. So, initial cavemen, the first humans, simple needs just to survive. If you were hungry, you foraged, you, were, you hunted. If you were cold, you, um, you built a fire, you put on some furs. If you uh, needed shelter, you found yourself a cave, you built yourself a roof. But through all of that, what humans are really good at is making tools that help them make their own lives easier. So things that take advantage of your environment, um, things like hand axes for hunting, uh, furs themselves for clothes, help people to take over their environment and make their own lives easier. And you might think, well, that's what separates us from the animals, this ability to take over our environment. But that's just not true. Animals are brilliant at using tools and do back then and do now. We've got crows that use sticks to hunt for insects. Octopi use coconut shells as shields. Hermit crabs as well use tools to build their own shelters. Otters use rocks as hammers to smash open shells. They can eat what's inside. Apes use sticks for all sorts of things, from um, hunting, using them for fishing, to weapons, fighting each other, to just toys, just to play, no real purpose, just have a bit of fun. And so animals take advantage of tools as well. They use them to take advantage of their environment, make their own lives easier. So if that doesn't make us different from them, well, what does? And really, we've got to go back a little bit to understand what has made us different to the animals. And really, it's, it's our communities, our ability to communicate, and our desire to share and build on what others do. So if you go all the way back to primitive man again, um, three and a half million years ago at the start of the Stone Age, when they developed something, the real skill that allowed humans to take over was our ability to build on the ideas of others, to share our understanding, and to create new things. So early tribes, some person somewhere, discovered that a flint axe was much better than just using a club to, to hunt. They shared that information with another tribe when they happened to meet them, and someone there built on that idea and said, well, if we put a longer handle on it, we'll be able to swing it faster. We'll do a better job of that. Someone somewhere else worked out that they could throw a stick. Someone else worked out if they sharpened that stick, it worked better. And it's this sharing amongst different people that allowed us to create these early inventions. But there's a problem, and there's a reason um, it took so long back in the old days. So three and a half million years of Stone Age, thousands of years of Iron and Bronze Age. And it's because when you try to share information face to face, as they had to do back then, it takes a really long time. Your tribe might only meet another tribe once every 200 years. You're hardly going to create these vast developments in technology when you can't share your information and your ideas. 
at any form of pace. And so what changed? How did we manage to increase our technological development? Well, really, it was pictures. Started off just as, as fundamental art. Art's a really important part of us as people. Um, lots of psychologists will say we wouldn't exist without art. We have to express ourselves, and people will express ourselves. Um, some people draw pictures, other people express themselves in different ways, but everyone has this form of expression. And art started just as sort of handprints and random smears, but quite quickly it turned into things that were more complicated. You see these pictures from something like 35,000 years ago, where we see people hunting, we see spears, we see sense of community, we see animals. And what that picture tells us, something really quite profound, is that through this image it tells us a story about them, we can understand something about life 35,000 years ago through a few little bits of red marks on a wall. And pictures have this incredible power to do this, to share information beyond just the person who made the picture. And it's that power of pictures that has created the modern world as we know it. And so what we wanted to do was do a little demonstration of just how powerful pictures are. So um, do we have a brave volunteer? Yeah? yeah. Or do you want, we could, we could let you off the hook if you want to take part, yeah? Some of my uh, unfortunate former students decided to come, so I was going to rope them in, but I'm happy to have a different volunteer. So do we need, have we got a microphone? I didn't tell you it involved speaking, did I? <laughs> so, um, quite simple, if you come to this side. So what I have inside here is a mystery object that Duncan has not seen before. I've and been you hiding... you can't show me either. You can't show it? me either. Here, we'll do this. I've been hiding it behind a towel all day so Duncan can't see it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift up that box and without you saying actually what it is, I want you to describe its shape and form for one minute. Duncan's going to draw it and we're going to see how close he gets. Okay? Does this require teamwork? <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so I'll lift up the box for you. Okay. Um, you ready? Mm -hmm. Steady. Go. Go and describe its shape. So mm. <laughs> well, well, it's got a rectangle body in a different. Could you could you just change that like ninety degrees? Oh no, you can't see what I'm doing. You just need to just have a <laughs> what? Flow of okay, so um, it's all a right. rectangular body. Um, it has. It has a. Could I say that? Yeah. It has a tail. It. It's got a head, a bit like a giraffe, but not, not a giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> not really helping. Um, it's on top of this wheel thing. Um, right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a car, but it's not a car. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, it's got eyes. Um, and ears. Zero. There we go. So. Well done. Well done. So not very easy, is it? For the sake of the camera, I think. We had a little toy wooden horse. There you go, Duncan. Oh, wow. Okay. How did you do? <laughs> I had no idea. A photorealistic representation. So I think what I found difficult about that is that all the descriptions which were given to me, uh, they lacked a... a, a there was, uh, there was an articulation of how they relate to one another. So although I roughly came up with the overall form, it's beautiful. it lacks the specific details for me to actually recreate this in a way which would be, you would need to if you wanted to have it for someone else. So. Yep. Yep. so people always say a picture is worth a thousand words, but it takes much more than a thousand words to describe a picture. Words themselves aren't great at describing form. Linguists would say language is our most important invention. To be honest, they are probably right, but there are certain things that it is absolutely terrible at doing. This wall of text I've just put up in front of you is three paragraphs from a 30-page document describing a single object in a patent application written by someone whose job it is to describe form. Try and read that. If you can ignore the typos in it, it's utterly impenetrable. It doesn't make any sense. Or I could just do that, and now you know it's a chest of drawers. It takes a fraction of a second when you have a picture, it takes hours, hours, weeks to understand when it's, when it's words. And this is the power of pictures. This is what we as engineers use to create the world that we live in. 
So what I want to tell you for the next little bit is, well, how did we develop this, this language of pictures that we use? Where did it come from? Why does it exist? Why does it exist in the way it does? And then Duncan after me is going to talk a bit about what the future might hold for it. So to work out where it came from, we have to go back an awfully long way again, not quite so far as the Stone Age this time, but back to a guy called King Gudea from ancient Mesopotamia. And what happened to King Gudea is he went to bed one night and had a dream in which he saw a vision of a temple that he thought he was meant to make, he thought he should make. So he um, recorded this, this image of the temple and he gave the image to his sculptors and his sculptors included it on all of the sculptures of him because it's something that showed he was close to God. And what we see over here is this image that he drew. And why that's interesting to us as engineers is that is recognizable as what we call a plan view, a view from above, where if you filled in those lines, those are the outside walls of this building. And what's really interesting to us is this guy was around well over 4,000 years ago. But right now, today, if I had some Lego, I could build his original temple exactly as he wanted it. The power of pictures transcends time easily throughout. It's simple to do. It's an incredibly powerful medium. But his purpose wasn't to share information. His purpose was to show off how close he was to God and how good he was. And it's an awfully long time before people started realizing this power of pictures. About 800 years, in fact, through to the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Romans. And they discovered this need, really, through, um, through the needs of their own work, their own technology. So they are famous for their structures the temple complexes, the Colosseum, the um, Parthenon, the ancient Greeks did similar things with the Acropolis, where they built these huge buildings, these huge structures, incredible things considering the time that they were built. And as they were building these, they very quickly realized that it was beyond the scope, the capabilities of a single person by, by a mile to build it. It took many people to do the design work. It took many people to work out how to actually make it. It took even more to actually build it. And so if they couldn't control it within their own mind, they needed to share the information. And how did they share the information? They realized that words weren't going to do the job, so they had to draw pictures. So what you'd have is your architect, architecture, the first great design, um, design profession. Your architect would draw out the picture. He would then use the picture to do calculations. This calculation is a really important part if you're designing a building. It's got to stay standing. It's got to hold thousands of people. Imagine the maths that go behind the Colosseum. That's hard now, let alone that many thousands of years ago. And then they would take those drawings and they would give them to their builders, give them to their workers, and they would construct it. And so in terms of architecture, in terms of buildings, technology blossomed with this, with this sharing of information. People could build on the work of others. They had historical records in drawings. And technology grew, buildings grew. Um, in Europe, we had the great cathedrals built just 12 miles down the road in Bath. We've got um, the abbey there that was well over 1,000 years old, this incredible structure. And it's the drawings that allowed that to happen. And to illustrate it was the drawings, if we look at things that are a bit smaller, we can start to see the pattern. So here we've got small objects, things that are just designed and built by a single person. Um, and we find technology didn't really develop quickly um, through thousands of years even. So there we've got a Roman pot, 2,000 years old, a Viking hand axe from about 600 AD, some Celtic medallions about 800 or 900 AD, a triptych there about 1300 AD. Incredible objects in their own right, beautiful objects, but the level of technological development from one to another isn't that high, isn't that great. They're all actually quite similar in their level of sophistication. And the reason is that the person who built it was also the person who made it. They didn't need to share information about it. They didn't need to spread their knowledge. In fact, it was beneficial for them to not spread their knowledge because if someone else could make it, then they couldn't charge as much for it. And something like that, that was made for royalty. That was an expensive object. If they were 10 a penny, that person would have been out of a living. So it was actually better to keep things secret. And what we then have to see is that technology didn't develop quickly at all. We stalled in the world of small objects while the buildings soared above us. Small things stayed quite primitive, quite simple. But things did change. So the question is, well, why did they change? And really, it was through the Renaissance that everything changed, um, changed for the better. So two things happened in the Renaissance, really. The first is that people started dedicating their time to the pursuit of knowledge, the pursuit of technology, partly because they were wealthy enough, they had enough um, resources to be able to do so. But, um, also because technology had developed to a level where things became more complex, became beyond the scope of a single person to cope with. 
So you'd have your designers who would design something, but they might need to send it to someone else to make, to do the manufacturing. They needed to share that information. And the people who were trying to share knowledge and grow technology, it was beneficial for them to share their information amongst as many people as possible so technology could grow. And so what you see in the Renaissance is technology did grow, and it's through these sorts of drawings that have, have lasted to today. So in the 1300s, we see the drawings of, um, of clocks, the inner workings of clocks, of complicated mechanisms. A couple of drawings by Leonardo da Vinci, we see a, a crossbow, but we also see a sketch there of how the mechanism that fires it works, them trying to share the information of how this works so someone else could do it and build on it. We see here what um, we as engineers would call an exploded view of a winch, which is all of these different components shown separate, but how they would go together so you can see how it would actually work. And over here, we see um, pipes cut through in what we engineers would call a sectional view. We've cut away half of the image, so again, you can see how it works on the inside. And this sharing of information is what allowed us to develop these ideas and allow technology's growth to accelerate. And accelerate it did, all the way through to the Industrial Revolution, where, again, step change happened. What happened in the Industrial Revolution is we discovered some incredible technologies that really shaped the world today. So mainly power, steam power, water power, coal power, and these sorts of things created huge new capabilities. These factories that make thousands of things on looms, trains that go faster than any horse ever could. But part of that is the complexity that comes with it. I mean, look at the number of little bits of thread on there. These aren't simple machines. It's not within the capabilities of a single person to understand it, especially when you want these factories, these trains to be made all over the world, and even more when you want not one train, you want thousands of trains. So complexity accelerated, the needs grew, and so what happened was, well, they needed drawings. They needed drawings to share. But whereas before, people like Leonardo da Vinci, he chose the drawing that he thought was best, it could be understood by someone who knew the area, knew the field, knew about these weapons. It's not really good enough anymore because you don't know who's going to be looking at your drawing. You need a bit more precision, a bit more accuracy, a bit more consistency. And so what happened was the start of what we now recognize as modern technical drawings. I say modern, still a few hundred years old. But what we, get, um, what we start to see is, is rules around pictures, rules around images that allow us to understand them quickly and easily, particularly as engineers with a bit of training. So here we see Watt's steam engine from the 1780s, and that's what we would call an assembly drawing. And all that means is that you can see the inside of some of these tanks, the inside of some of these pistons. You see arrows that point where things go and where things move. And suddenly that's no longer just a static image. That tells us exactly how it works. We can look at that image and we could make it. And it's the consistency in how it's drawn allows someone who wasn't there when it was devised to understand how it could be made in order to make it themselves. We also see things here like this Trevithick's um, tram engine, one of the first trains. And as we were doing these drawings, we realized quite an obvious fact, really. Everything we're designing is 3D, but our paper is 2D. And so instead of just having some random view that the person thought was good, we needed some rules so we could understand that. So what we have here is what we would call an orthogonal drawing as engineers. We have a side view there, and you have an end view here. And there's certain rules about how these map together. So they show two different views of the same object that you then fold around, and it makes a 3D object. And we as engineers, we're trained not to see two images there. We see one 3D object that you can rotate in your mind and understand in a consistent way. And this consistency is what allowed us to grow and share ideas and develop our technology. Another step change happened um, in the mid-1800s in America. Unfortunately, lots of technological developments come through the military, and uh, technical drawings is one of them, um, where in the, the American Civil War, they needed to make 600,000 muskets for their soldiers, however many millions of bullets. Obviously not made by one person, obviously not even made by one company, made by hundreds of companies all around the US, probably all around the world. And they were all making different parts. You don't get every company to make the whole gun. You get each company to make a bit of it. So your problem then becomes, how do we know these bits are going to fit together? This is actually pretty precise engineering, pretty precise machinery. You need the stock to fit with the barrel. You need that to fit with the bullet. You need that to fit with whatever else goes into it. And so they needed more consistency, more rules. And what we start to see here is, um, for this bullet, some of these dimensions, they have things called tolerances built into them, which is sort of the range of sizes that something could be for it to still work when you try to put it together. 
In some of the other drawings, you start to see things like um, manufacturing instructions, material types, assembly instructions, and all the rules around them, which mean that you can send these drawings to any company in the world, and they can make something that you know will work for you when you get it back. And that's an incredible power. You can talk to the other side of the planet through pictures, despite them not understanding a word of your actual language. So that's really what we've developed as engineers. That's what's enabled us to get to the stage we're at now. And these days, what we have is drawing standards. And drawing standards, not the most interesting of subjects. Again, my students will probably attest to that. You did well, guys. So drawing standards, it's our dictionary. It's our rule book. It's our vocabulary. And the, the important thing about it for us is, whereas other people just see a couple of black lines on a piece of paper, we're trained to see more than that. These lines represent different things. We have thicker lines for outside edges, thin lines for inside edges, dashed edges, for, uh, dashed lines for things that are hidden on the inside, different types of lines for things that move. We have simplified views for things like screw threads. Can you imagine drawing the complicated spiral on a screw thread over and over again? Again, my students do know what that's like. Uh, but there's simpler ways to do it. And we have this vocabulary, these rules that allow us to do it quickly. And so after a bit of training, understanding this vocabulary, what does it mean? Well, it means that where some people see black lines on a piece of paper, what we see as engineers is a 3D object. But not only do we see a 3D object, we see how it works. We see how it's made. We see how it fits with everything else. And more than that, we see how we could change it to make it better, how we could manipulate it to our own application, how we could make it develop and make it grow. And it's that capability of pictures that has enabled the world that we live in. Every single object in this room, I can say with some confidence, as well as every machine that made every object in this room, as well as every machine that made the machines that made every object in this room, was designed through this. Every single thing we touch today has technical drawings behind it or the machines that made it. They are the, the lifeblood of engineering that have allowed us to create the world that we live in. So while some people might see just a few lines, what we see is 5,000 years of history that has allowed us to create the world that we see today. But that's all in the past, and the future's always more interesting, isn't it, Duncan? Thank you very much. So I'll pass over to him. So Chris has told us about how we got to the kind of relative modern period, um, but where's it going to go beyond drawings uh, today? Now, Chris has alluded to one of the key issues uh, about engineering drawings is that we've come up with this very complex system to describe how to, how to draw 3D objects on a 2D piece of paper. And that paper is really a major limitation in this process. So if we look here, this is a typical scene from an engineering company in the mid 20th century. And what they would have there would be a whole series of people who were trained in the art of creating these drawings. And it took a, a, a tremendous amount of training and a huge amount of skill to be able to do that. So if you think about the sort of components and objects which they'd be manufacturing back then, things like cars and trains, well actually they have a few thousand components involved with them. Now each one of those components is going to have an engineering drawing and that drawing is going to be on paper. So that's fine for then when there's only thousands and, or maybe tens of thousands of drawings, but when you start to consider modern day objects, things like the Airbus A380, the, uh, the super jumbo jet, well that's got over eight and a half million components in it. If you were to practically have every single one of those on a piece of paper, we just couldn't really do it. We couldn't realize those things which we wanted to make. And what happens when you want to start to update those components? How do you start to deal with that? Do you have to go to those drawings and you have to redo them? Do you have to, um, uh, do you have to go and retrieve them from a store? And what happens when you want to make that, uh, that part all over the world? Do you have to send those drawings to everyone? How do you actually feasibly do that? Well, they started to come up against these issues back in the 1950s, and they invented the first computer-aided design software. And computer-aided design was what we call CAD for short. And what it did initially was to help to manage the process of all these number of drawings. And initially, they just did it with the 2D, uh, with 2D drawings. So they took all of those drawing standards which Chris showed us, and they just put them into an electronic system and allowed the computer to do the heavy lifting. And it's not really for another 20 or 30 years until the late 70s that we see a real step change in our capability. Everything to date has been about kind of trying to describe 3D geometry on a 2D piece of paper. But with solid modelers, we're now able to start to describe 3D geometry. And this is a major, major advantage because we no longer have to spend time and effort trying to reconstruct different views in our heads to come up with a 3D object. The computer does that for us straight away. 
We no longer have to come up with static projection views to, think, um, to view things from different angles and get all the detail. With a, with a 3D model, we can inspect any angle of it and get information really quickly. And that frees up time to spend more on designing and developing things so that they're improved. Now, just to illustrate this point, we've got a set of drawings here and some equivalents which have been produced in a CAD program. So the top two drawings are of an engine, as are the bottom two. And the top two have been done by hand. And if you look at the image in the, in the far right-hand corner there, the skill and the effort which has gone into creating that drawing by hand is fantastic. So the sketching, uh, the sketching and the shading which is included in it, that shading gives a sense of three-dimensionality. And that's not a simple thing to be able to master. They've also got the scale and the proportion correct. And the scale and the proportion were distorted while well, it would disrupt your understanding of what's being shown. The guy is also, the person's actually also done a cut through for it, so you can see how the internal machinations of the engine actually operate. And that takes a lot of effort to think, if I'm cutting through here, what can I see? What can't I see? It's prone to error. And it means that if you do get it wrong, you probably have to start all over again. And it takes a very, very long time to do anything. Now, conversely, in the bottom, we've got a computer, uh, some CAD software, where the engine's been drawn within that. And there's this one-time fixed cost to generating those parts. But once you've got them, the computer does all the visualization for you. If I want to look at one of the parts in the bottom, which is maybe slightly obscured from that current view, I just click a few buttons and I can see it. And again, it means that it frees up all this time and effort away from having to just understand the drawings and allows us to spend more time on actually designing the things. But there's still a problem with this, is that we're still using kind of uh, inputs to generate this jump, which don't seem very natural. Those CAD programs, we're using a mouse and a keyboard, and it doesn't seem like the most kind of the best way that we can generate that, uh, that geometry. And we're also still looking at it on a 2D screen. So we've got a kind of optical illusion where we're given the impression of three dimensionality, but it's still not actually 3D. So maybe with technologies, things like virtual reality or augmented reality, mixed reality, things which you might be hearing about in the news at the moment, well, with those sorts of technologies, we can start to visualize things in actual three dimensions. And again, this helps with our conceptual understanding of what we're looking at. And we can even start to visualize things in situ. So rather than having to sit in my office in front of my computer, tapping away on my keyboard and a mouse to generate the car engine, I can actually go walk into the production plant, I can walk into the car, and I can put on my goggles, and I can see the engine and how it's going to fit in front of it, fit within the rest of the car. I can also check to see what the aesthetics might be like. So does that car look really nice on my driveway? Does it look really good when it's going down the motorway? And again, with having this three-dimensionality and the ability to visualize it, it helps with our conceptual understanding and frees up time so we can spend more time designing. But we've also got the ability to kind of generate this geometry in true three dimensions. So the gentleman here on the slide, he's using a 3D light stylus. So he's able to track this through the air and manipulate parts and to create the forms. But actually, it turns out we're not very good at creating that geometry in three dimensions. If you were to move your hand through the air, and you're meant to do it and you do the same thing again, it's actually very difficult to move your hand consistently, precisely, accurately through the air multiple times. And CAD and design, it needs consistency, it needs the precision and it needs the accuracy to describe those forms. So maybe what we need to do is actually go back in time to when we had the age of craft and we had the physical mediums involved. And this is what myself and Chris are involved with in, within our research group, which is trying to add tangibility and physicality back into design process. And if you just think about when a, a master potter sat at his potter's wheel and he's got the clay in his hands, the clay provides a physical feedback into what he's designing. He knows when it feels right, when he's got to the, to the point where the design is a, a, a approaching completion. And the physicality is also really important because ultimately we're designing and building things to go into the real world. So the physical properties must also be important, things like the mass, the surface texture. But if it's really difficult to actually move our hands through the air without any feedback, and it's difficult to do things like pottery because you need lots of skill and training, how can we get around that? Well, one of the ways which we try and do it is by using construction kits, which the most common is Lego. Now, the benefit of LEGO is that two different people can place the same brick in exactly the same place every single time that they want to. So maybe we could take some of those physical tools, add in some of the, the benefits of the digital tools, like all the management of the drawings and being able to share the information and merge them together so we get this physical and digital design tool. 
So we're doing this as part of the design and manufacturing group, and Chris has told us lots about how over the ages that design and manufacture have always gone hand in hand and how the needs of one has driven the development of the other one. And in all this time, we've also been increasing our capabilities to manufacture new things. And it's a really important theme for design. So with 3D printing, or to give it its proper name, additive manufacturing, and other advanced machining techniques like CNC machining, so computer numerically controlled, we're able to increase the, the variety of shapes that we, uh, that we were beforehand. And what this ha has is a really big difference in how we do design and the language with which we talk to one another. So no longer do I create a drawing of a part to go and hand to a machinist in our workshops and ask you, can you go and produce this for me? I now have a 3D, geome now have 3D geometry and a 3D file, which I send over to my printer and then the printer uh, creates that. And we're able to cre uh, create much more, uh, a, a, a much wider range of different shapes, which is really valuable for us uh, going forward in terms of what we can actually do with, uh, with these technologies. But there's still limitations to it. So the variety of materials which we can use with something like 3D printing is quite limited. So it's typically a subset of types of plastics. And we still have to think about how we're going to design the part to make sure that it actually works. And it also takes quite a long time. And anything which takes time disrupts your flow of your design process, and it, it slows the rate of development down. So that kind of takes us to where we are now with what we can do at the moment. But what's going to happen going forwards from here? Where's this new language of design going to take us? And we've had 5,000 years of trying to come up with clever ways of describing the form and the shape of things. But really what we're doing now is we're moving into a new age where we're going to be describing the functionality of things instead. And the tools that we have to do that shouldn't limit our creativity and our ability to conceive. So what we need are new, new ways of designing. So right at the very beginning, Chris talked about one of the principal advantages of having a drawing is that you could do calculations. Now, the sorts of calculations we do are very simplified. So if we're going to design a bridge, and we're going to teach our students how to do that, we'd take a simplified model of that. And we might model it as a series of beams uh, just to make the, uh, the math simpler and easier to do so. Now, but with a computer, when, once you have 3D geometry, we can break it up into lots of smaller parts. And we can do all of those calculations on those very small bits and then aggregate them all together. And this has a real tremendous advantage in terms of being able to design and to inform the design process. And it also enables us to do sorts of calculations that we couldn't practically or economically do beforehand. So with the example here, we have a car, and you can see how the fluid of the air moves over it whilst it's going at speed. Now, in the old days, you'd have to create that car and then put it into a wind tunnel and then pour smoke over it to see how the, uh, the airflow goes. So if we've got this capability of computational analysis and we've got the ability to generate 3D geometry and we've also got the ability to actually realise that geometry with things like 3D printing, that typical design, build and test cycle, well, we can start to push them all together. We can blur the lines between them. And if we don't need to talk to another human being and we don't need to create drawings for them to manufacture something, where does that take us going forwards? And the answer is this new concept of computational design. And this is really where the future of design is most likely going to head. Now, computational design it gets the computer to do the heavy lifting of generating the form and the shape. And as designers, we're responsible for coming up with the functionality of what that component is going to do. And computational design is really well illustrated by this example which we've got on the board here. So we've got three accelerator pedals taken from Formula One cars. Now in Formula One, there's a real drive to try and minimize the mass of every single component in the car. If you can make your car weigh less, it's going to give you a competitive advantage, advantage over other drivers. So when we're going to uh, try and get the computer to design this, well, we need to put in some initial parameters. So we need to describe the functionality that that foot pedal needs to do. So in terms of this football, what are the things it's going to have to do? Well, it's going to have to resist a certain amount of force from when the driver slams his foot down on it all the way to the floor. It's also going to have to sit within a certain envelope within the vehicle. It can't take up too much space. And it's also going to have to interface with the rest of the car. So we can see at the very top here, there's some connectors which allow it to, go, uh, uh, to transmit that force which the driver applies into the back of the car. But at the same time, we want it to weigh as little as possible. And we wanted it to do that within a certain package. So we put those parameters into our computer model. And the computer model generates this cellular-like structure with all these branches going between to optimize the mass for it. And in doing so, we get a, 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 a performance improvement as something which isn't really conceivable that a human designer could actually achieve in that process. 
But I think it's safe to say that Chris and I aren't going to be out of the job anytime soon because computational design is quite limited to these really uh, highly constrained problems at the moment. And it's also not very transparent when something goes wrong. So if this suddenly fails, you have to put a lot of trust within your uh, computational design algorithm and in understanding how it works to figure out where the fault has occurred. Now, I think that brings us to the end of the talk at this point here. So um, if there's any questions, we'd be more than happy uh, to take them. I've finished slightly abruptly there, but uh, this new language of design is going to be about describing the functionality rather than the form of things. Thank you very much. <laughs>With things like virtual reality, the technology is quite exclusive. As soon as you put on your headset, you're on your own. No one else is there to help you in that process. So I think with engineers, it's all about teamwork. We're all working with other people. So it has a place within the design process. But I think that tactile sense is something we crave yeah. very much so. I think the important thing for engineers is we're really good at some things and we're awful at others. And Computers are very good at this sort of thing. No human could conceive that, could work out what shape it should be. But a computer manages to make it weigh 10% of the, um, the mass, but work just as well. We couldn't do that, but a computer couldn't decide what the functionality needed to be. And it's this, these sorts of things as well. Humans really like tangibility. Computers don't need tangibility. There's some tasks that computers are much better at. But in terms of communication, computers aren't great at supporting that. They keep things inside themselves. So there's always going to be a split, and there's always going to be a battle between these different parts. And that's really, that's our challenge, is to work out where that line's gonna lie and how we can make the most of it. I think with the, the tangibility as well, there's, there's, as Chris was saying, there's a time and a place for it. And one of the areas which we work in is, is trying to democratize design tools, so uh, making design tools available for lots of different people. And we kind of think that often people are best placed to solve their own solutions, but they don't have the right tools to do so. So CAD software it takes a very long time to, to learn how to use. It's quite complicated. It requires a lot of precision in how you're doing it. But with tangible mediums, there's an intuitiveness to it. So it helps you to engage more people in the design process, people that you're probably trying to design solutions for. So that's why we want to kind of push that bit with the Lego. And Lego's by far the most commonly kind of understood kind of uh, design tool, I think. Thank you. Um, do you think in the future that it's possible that um Computers will become better designers than humans. They already are, <laughs> in some ways, at least. In terms of the whole uh, cohort of design, I suppose, yeah. um, computers aren't creative. Computers create. They are not creative. They make things. They don't innovate. When you tell a computer to create something and you know what you want it to make, it is excellent. When you say, I have a problem, find a solution, it is terrible at the moment. That requires artificial intelligence, and that's all about trying to make computers think like people anyway, where people are already better at that task. So in certain ways, they're better than us already. Technology is only going to get better, so they're only going to get more capable as well. But we're safe in our jobs for a little while yet. I think that's quite a while before humans are out of the picture. I, I think we see the computers as freeing us up to do stuff that we actually want to do and that we're good at. So all the heavy lifting and the boring kind of management process where you're just like trying to manage all the drawings, it, you don't want a human doing that. They're prone to error. Things where you're coming up with aesthetics, so how something looks, like the most like, successful products are the ones which look the best <laughs> and they're ones which there's, a, uh, there's an empathy in how they've gone into being designed. People understand, the designer understands how it's going to be used at the other, at their end. I think it's hard to imagine how a computer could do that at the moment, but I certainly wouldn't rule it out 
in the long run, but they hopefully they'll make the process simpler rather than trying to replace our kind of human design process. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.